Last month, the long-awaited epic space adventure Starfield finally landed on our PCs and Xbox consoles, and the more I've played and explored Bethesda's new sandbox, the more I've enjoyed it. It's a classic Bethesda RPG which mixes together structured, linear storylines with a level of unpredictability as you collect random quests and are pulled in different directions that to me always makes the adventure feel personal and unique. And it's almost impossible not to get distracted by an entire galaxy of things around you. I started with the best intentions of seeing through the main campaign and yet every time I find myself on a completely different planet from where I intended to be, fighting space pirates, cataloguing plants and wildlife or collecting rare minerals as I expand my outposts. I love this exploration and sense of discovery that Starfield has so far provided and despite it being Bethesda's first completely new universe in a quarter of a century, if you've played their titles before, can't help but notice the Elder Scrolls and Fallout DNA throughout, whether it be the crafting and building systems, combat gameplay, or familiar NPCs who make a reappearance. In this video I've pulled together some tips and tricks aimed at new players that I've learned since I first started playing. I'll aim to cover off the basics such as early skill choices and why, things to look out for as you adventure early on, and gameplay shortcuts and so on. I'm Mike the Gaming Dad and welcome to my new player tips for Starfield. So starting out at the beginning, after the game's initial introduction on the moon of Vectera, the player will enter character creation mode, and as always, the first time around this can be quite overwhelming. There are a total of 21 character backgrounds you can choose from, that will each have 3 starting perks already provided for you. And what I will say about these is, don't overthink it. If you want to roleplay a specific character or playstyle then fine, but your choice only has a superficial impact on your gameplay experience. You aren't going to make any wrong choices here, or find yourself bound to completing a questline one specific way when you would have liked to have chosen another path. And although each background contains three starting skill perks, as with the majority of games that contain a levelling system, your early levelling progress happens quickly, so you will mould your character the way you want to anyway, and if you find yourself with a perk point in a skill you don't use, it's not going to matter in the long run. The difference in gameplay between the, these backgrounds is how NPCs interact with you, whether it be comments in conversation or options to pick within the dialogue system. So for example I pick the soldier and occasionally I've had a dialogue option that suits this background. After selecting your character's background, you will also have the opportunity to pick three optional traits and these can have a large impact on your gameplay experience within Starfield. Essentially each trait gives you two passive effects, one positive and one negative. So take alien DNA for example, you'll start with increased health and oxygen, but healing and food items won't be as effective. And this directly affects your gameplay, and there are other traits similar to this. For example empath, whereby you'll receive temporary boost to your combat ability if you perform actions your followers like, and a decrease if you do the opposite. The introvert trait means you lose less oxygen when exerting yourself if you travel alone, but more if you travel with other human companions. And terra firma means you receive additional health and oxygen on the surface of planets, but less in space. And this last trait is one I selected on my first playthrough as I assumed I'd be spending most of my time actually on the surface, and less time in space, and so far that definitely has been the case, so I'm glad I chose this perk. It's worthwhile mentioning that as well as these traits which affect your gameplay stats, if you want to call them that, there are also traits which can introduce completely new gameplay elements. So if you select kid stuff, your character will have living and breathing parents, who you can visit and interact with and they'll occasionally give you stuff and you can even access a cool new ship with this perk, but the drawback is you send them 2% of your credits each week. If you select the wanted perk, you'll have a price on your head, so bounty hunters will occasionally show up and try to kill you or demand you pay them, but the positive is you do extra damage when your health is low. And this is the second of the traits I actually selected on my first playthrough, and I'm glad I did now. Extra opportunities for space combat are always welcome, and there are perks that actually require you to destroy a set amount of enemy ships, so this has actually been a useful perk to me. Even if the first time I encountered the bounty hunters I was caught off guard and had no spare ship parts on me and was subsequently killed. You also occasionally get unique dialogue options with this trait as well. I heard that. Okay, so let's talk. And lastly, we couldn't move on without talking about the Hero Worships perk. Those that have played Oblivion before will remember the adoring fan. Well guess what? They are back. 
Select this perk and he'll show up randomly from time to time, and you can even invite him to join your crew and he'll give you gifts. I'm not sure what the negative is here with this trait actually, but here's a sneak preview of your first interaction with him and I'll let you decide for yourself. By Vectera, by Vectera, by Vectera! I can't believe it! Is it you? Is it really, really you? Captain of the Frontier, Bane of the Fleet, Constellation's shining star of stars. He's an interesting character, isn't he? But my advice for the traits is, don't sleep on them. They may be optional, and I bet the drawbacks to each one may put some people off, but the ones that add new gameplay features in like Dream Home, Kid Stuff, Wanted and Hero Worshipped are well worth looking into. So let's move on to the Starfield skill tree system and what perks are available to you. For the purpose of this video I'll only be covering off the first row of perks within each skill tree, as these are the ones that you'll be choosing between at first. And in Starfield you have five skill trees which are physical, social, combat, science and tech. And then within these there are four tiers of perks to choose from. To unlock each tier you need to spend a certain amount of perk points within that tree, and each perk has four levels to choose from ranging from level 1 which may introduce a new skill or make a current skill slightly more effective up to level 4 at which point the skill will become very effective with more unlockable benefits and so on. So let's start out with the physical tree. The first skill within this tree is boxing. At each subsequent rank your unarmed attacks will do 25% more damage. At ranks 1 and 2 you will also use less O2 when power attacking and then at rank 3 you also consume less O2 whilst running and finally at rank 4 you have the chance to knock down opponents. And probably unsurprisingly this is a very niche skill. If you plan to run an unarmed build it's essential and probably your most important skill but the vast majority of players I personally wouldn't waste your time with this one. Next up we have the fitness skill and this perk gives you increased O2 with each subsequent rank. So rank 1 is 10%, 2 is 20%, 3 is 30 and then finally at rank 4 your power attacks and sprinting uses a lot less oxygen, approximately half the cost, which is a significant jump. If you're wondering what your O2 bar is, you'll find it in the bottom left corner and you can see it deplete as you sprint or use power attacks. And once you run out of O2 you'll start to see this bar turn red and this is CO2 building up. And I wanted to show this quickly as the challenge to level this skill up is to use all oxygen X amount of times. But what it actually means is use all available oxygen and half fill the CO2 bar. Only then will it actually count. But anyway, I'd say this is an okay skill, probably somewhere in the middle, and it certainly won't be a bad choice to invest in it early on. But later on as your character reaches a much higher level, the rank 4 benefits are going to be really strong and definitely worth investing in. The third perk in the physical tree is the stealth skill. Ok, let's cut to the chase. Unless you specifically want to make things harder for yourself, or roleplay as a bell wearing elf so everyone knows you are coming a mile away, at a bare minimum you should be spending one perk point in this tree, and eventually I'd go all the way up to rank 4. At rank 1 you unlock a stealth meter. Yes that is correct, you won't even have access to knowing if you're about to be detected or not unless you pick this skill. You also become harder to detect with each subsequent rank, and you'll do more damage if you sneak attack your targets. At rank 4 as well, you'll be able to open doors without being detected. And now I haven't personally played with rank 4 yet, but what I can say is, enemies notice doors open very easily. There doesn't even need to be line of sight. If you open a door, there's a chance an enemy is going to wonder why that door just opened and come looking. So I imagine level 4 is going to be essential for sneaky players. So overall, this is a top tier perk. The fourth perk is weightlifting, and personally I'm a bit torn on this one. At rank 1 you gain a measly 10 extra kilos to your carrying capacity, rank 2 is 25, rank 3 is 50, and finally rank 4 is 100 kilos, plus you're 50% less likely to be staggered when struck by an enemy, which feels like a nice benefit for players who like to get up close and personal. Now why I am torn on this skill is, no one in Starfield is a bigger black hole for stuff than me. If you watch my let's play you'll see that I'm constantly on the edge of my carrying capacity and yet I still can't resist the next shiny piece of space junk I come across. The reason I'm torn is, the need for this skill can be totally negated by just managing your inventory better. 
sell what you don't need, utilize your companions and make sure you use your ship's cargo and so on. But what I will say about this skill is, if you have perks to burn, especially later on, the rank 4 perk of this skill is where you're going to reap the most benefit, so you're going to get more bang for your buck. So rank 1 I'm going to say is below average and can be avoided early on, but rank 4 is definitely above average. Finally in the physical tree we have wellness, and the benefits of this perk are pretty straightforward. At rank 1 you get 10% more health, at rank 2 20% more, 3 is 30% more, and finally 4 is 40% more, and that's it. You don't get any additional benefits from reaching rank 4. Now this perk is definitely going to be useful on unarmed or melee builds, harder difficulties, or players who like mad challenges like permadeath runs, but the need for it can be negated by utilising better gear, or simply by being hit less. And I invested a perk in this early on as my gear was weak, and I found myself taking heavy damage, but the more I've played, the less I've relied on that extra 10%. So I'm going to rank this somewhere in the middle. Extra health isn't a complete waste of time, but some players may not need it. Next up we have the social skills, and the first perk in this skill tree is commerce. At rank 1 you buy for 5% less and sell for 10% more, and then after that point each rank you gain a 5% increment to each. So rank 2 is buy for 10% less and sell for 15% more. Rank 3 is buy for 15% less and sell for 20% more and so on. So actually rank 1 gives you the biggest increase, as your selling price is increased by 10% first of all. If you don't like scavenging for stuff and find yourself buying your ammo and supplies, you may want to invest in this perk, but I'm the opposite, I scavenge absolutely everything and sell sell sell, and I found that very quickly in the game I amassed over 100,000 credits. And now this isn't going to get you a lot of new ships, but it's adequate for most things in Starfield. And once you get into the realms of outpost farming, you won't need the perks in this tree. So my advice would be, don't invest in this perk, but if you do, take rank 1 only. Next up we have the gastronomy perk, and I've been playing around with this skill recently, and unless I'm missing something, I have to say I'm a little disappointed. The perk gives you access to new recipes which you can research, and then subsequently craft these at cooking stations. And now my hope for this skill was something along the lines of Skyrim's alchemy. I expected some recipes to be really valuable, or unlock cool new benefits like some random alien recipe that makes you sprint faster, or regen health. But I didn't find anything of note. If you want your character to enjoy a nice carbonara, or an alien stir fry after fighting off some spaces on a frozen moon, then invest in this perk, but otherwise I won't bother, it's pretty useless. What I do hope for this skill is further down the line we see some survival mode style gameplay whereby you absolutely have to invest in learning how to cook, but for now, you're safe to leave it alone. The third perk in the social skill tree is persuasion. Now I've been playing this game for about a month now, and certainly not extensively like some people, but enough to notice that persuasion opportunities come up a lot in Starfield. What this skill does is increase your chances of persuading someone, so rank 1 is 10%, 2 is 20%, then 30%, and finally it's 50% at rank 4. And this perk is by no means necessary to choose, but I'm going to be generous here and say this one is actually useful to invest in. Persuasion is often the tool that will avoid a large scale gunfight, convince an NPC to unlock a door for you so you aren't going to need to resort to breaking in, and in a lot of cases, your followers will actually like it if you manage to smooth talk your way out of a sticky situation. I invested one perk in this tree, and so far I don't regret it. Next up we have the scavenging skill. At rank 1 you'll have a chance of finding more credits in containers, and in Skyrim think of the Imperial Luck ability. At rank 2 it's a chance to find extra ammo, rank 3 is extra aid items, and finally rank 4 you'll be able to track resources with your hand scanner. I'm going to be honest here and say I've not tried out rank 4 yet, but if this plays out as it reads here on screen, it doesn't sound particularly game changing. Your hand scanner already colours items that you can pick up, which I'll show later, so why would it be essential that a tracked resource be a different colour? It feels like a lot to expend 4 perks just to unlock this, but that could just be me. What I will say about ranks 1-3 to three are, if you scavenge, you probably won't need to invest in this skill tree. So far I've never run out of credits or ammo, apart from one time when I went trigger happy with a weak ass Grendel. And ammo there are ways to ensure you maximise how much you loot, which I'll talk about later on. 
Obviously, if you don't scavenge, you may want to invest in this tree, but I'm going to say this is below average. Finally, we have the pickpocket perk. Now, if your character is a goody two shoes who never so much as looks at a guard funny, you can avoid this skill tree. But for most players, though, who want to experience more of what Starfield has to offer, I highly recommend throwing a perk point into this tree, even if it's just one. At rank 1 you will unlock the ability to pickpocket. And that's right, like the stealth tree, unlocking the stealth bar, without pickpocket rank 1 you can't even attempt it. After rank 1 each subsequent point spent makes your attempts more likely to succeed, and then at rank 4 you can pickpocket holstered weapons. It's not quite Skyrim's ability to completely undress NPCs without them noticing, but it's still okay. Getting caught pickpocketing is also a way of getting into the Crimson Fleet Guild, so overall I'm going to say rank 1 should be essential, with ranks 2 to 4 nice to haves, unless you are roleplaying as a baddie, in which case they may also be essential to you. The third skill tree is the Combat Tree, and the first perk within here is the Ballistics perk, and what this one does is make all ballistic weapons do more damage, so 10% at rank 1, 20% at 2, 30% at 3, and then finally at rank 4 your ballistic weapons range also increases by 30%. So what is a ballistic weapon? Well it's basically any weapon which fires bullets to deal physical damage, so not lasers, grenades, or explosives, and not EMP weaponry and so on. Now most of the weapons in Starfield are classed as ballistic, so this makes this a very worthwhile skill to invest in. I'm going to say that even early on, unless you are role playing a character that only uses melee combat or laser weapons for example, get this skill to rank 4 early. Having increased range on all ballistic weaponry as well as increased damage is a great perk investment and you'll notice a big difference when using weapons that have shorter ranges to begin with, like shotguns. So I'm going to rank this as essential unless you intentionally avoid ballistics. Next up we have the dueling perk. So this one is going to be like the unarmed skill in the physical tree, an absolute must have for melee builds, and for other players who don't use melee weapons, its value just isn't there and you can avoid it completely. What this perk does is increase your damage by 25% at rank 1, and makes you take 10% less damage from melee weapons when wielding. At rank 2 you run 20% faster after a melee kill, which feels like a nice perk actually for these builds. Kill, next target, kill, next target and so on. At rank 3 you'll do 50% more damage and receive 15% less, and at rank 4 each melee kill heals you for 10% of your health. And there's not much else to say about it really, you'll either want this perk or you won't. Next we have the lasers perk, and this one unsurprisingly works like the ballistics perk, but for laser based weaponry. As I mentioned earlier, ballistics weaponry is far more common, so for most players this is probably the route you should go down, unless you plan on specifically choosing laser guns in which case this perk becomes essential. Its first three perks work the same way as ballistics, giving you a 10% increase in damage each time. And what rank 4 does is interesting though, it gives you a 5% chance to actually set enemies on fire every round that hits. Now I've been set on fire by enemies before, and fire damage can be a problem as it can stack, so you can get set on fire once, and then this can be reset on fire before the effect of the first set of flames is actually worn off. I'm yet to try rank 4 out myself, but the cutter you get right at the start of the game is actually classed as an energy weapon, so I had this rather sadistic idea of making a pyromaniac cutter build utilising this perk and basically setting everything on fire. What? Don't look at me like that. We all know the stuff you get up to in games too. This is a safe space right? So I'm actually going to rank this like melee. For most people a standard playthrough just invest in ballistics. But if you want to try out a laser build it's essential and could actually be a lot of fun. The next skill is pistol certification, and at rank 1 your pistols will do 10% more damage, at rank 2 25%, at rank 3 50%, and then at rank 4 you get a plus 25% chance to crit after killing an enemy for 5 seconds. Now you may be thinking, ok he's going to say this is like the unarmed melee and lasers. If you want to make a pistol build it's essential, but for anyone else don't bother. And that's somewhat true. But instead, I'm going to give this perk a below average rank across the board. Well, why? I played around with pistols a lot and I just find them to be one of the weakest weapons types in the game. They may even be at the bottom of the pile, and I just rarely use them nowadays. You do get more damage at ranks 2 and 3 than you do in ballistics or lasers, and this perk does stack with ballistics, 
but I just don't think it's a worthwhile investment into a weak weapon class when you could use rifles, shotguns or other weaponry that just does so much more damage. Finally we have shotgun certification and like ballistics and lasers, ranks 1 to 3 provide 10 to 30% more damage output and rank 4 grants a small chance to stun enemies for a limited time. Small chance to stun basically translates as about 20% and limited time is for about 15 seconds. So this is a worthwhile perk for large groups or stronger enemies and definitely on harder difficulties where incapacitation is key to avoid being overwhelmed. Overall though, even without rank 4, I'm going to say this is a skill worthwhile investing in if you plan to use ballistics. I invested in both trees to stack shotgun damage and you'll have no problem one-shotting enemies early on. Shotguns are also a really fun weapon class. I found a pump action shotgun and immediately felt like I was playing classic Doom or Duke Nukem as I blasted enemies. Shotguns are definitely one of the more fun weapon types to use. Terminator build anyone? The fourth skill tree is the science tree and what I will say about this tree is, the first rank has a lot of disappointing skills in it, however some of the later skills are awesome and unlock a lot of cool new features. So this tree is one that you'll have to throw some perk points at to reap the rewards later on. First up we have the Astrodynamics perk, and each subsequent rank in this perk either increases your grav jump range or lowers the fuel cost of grav jump. Grav jumping is basically how you get across the different star systems in Starfield. Some systems are further away, requiring more jumps if you can't make the distance in one go and so on. The furthest away systems will require multiple stops, but unless you mine this, you don't need to invest in this perk, it's purely a time saver, a quality of life perk if you will, and you can also get around this perk by investing in shipbuilding. Better grav drives equals bigger grav jumps, and larger and better ships will be able to go much further as well. So overall I'm going to say this is middle of the road, not essential but not useless either. Next we have the geology skill, and what this does is give you a chance to get more common and incommon resources from surface objects at rank 1, and each rank after that increases the chances for rarer items. Surface objects basically means when you find ores and metals and use your cutter to mine them, it doesn't affect plants or wildlife. This is a pretty bad perk in my opinion, only receiving a percentage chance to harvest two ingredients instead of one is just bad, and that's before we even address the elephant in the room that manually gathering your ores is just incredibly time consuming. I tested trying to farm myself iron ores for a building project versus either getting an outpost to do it for me or simply buying them at the shop, and it wasn't even in the same ballpark. I was still scratching around for like my 6th ore when I'd already bought over 50 by just shopping and waiting. An outpost will do it for you 24-7. You may decide this is the way you want to go, a real hunter-gatherer type, but I warn you it'll be slow. I'm not saying don't ever use your cutter, I still use it from time to time when scanning and cataloging planets as a way of getting extra stuff, I just wouldn't bother investing in this perk. Next we have the medicine perk. And what this does is make your meds more effective by increasing the health restoration and speed of restoration by 10%, 20%, 30% and finally 50% at rank 4 with a chance to cure afflictions. I'm going to group this skill with wellness in the physical tree as both broadly do the same job. I haven't tested the rank 4 perk yet so I cannot comment on the effectiveness of curing afflictions but what I will say is I've scavenged a wide range of med packs that cure afflictions anyway and so far I haven't had any affliction that I've not been able to cure straight away simply by carrying the required item. Overall I'm going to rank this perk in the middle. If you play on higher difficulties or struggle in combat and use a lot of med packs then invest in it, but some players may not need it though. Next we have research methods and what this perk does is lower the resource costs associated with research projects and crafting by 10%, 20%, 40% and 60%, with the rank 4 perk also doubling your chances of having sudden developments during researching. And what a sudden development is, is where you attempt to research a section of a project, and you either gain an extra part of the project completion for less resources than initially required, or you fully complete the project without actually having to spend any resources in any other sections of it. So for example, I'm going to click onto Mixology here, and notice how we have already completed alkanes, but not aromatics or spice. Notice on the right how we have four aromatics in our inventory now, and we require two for this research. 
Let's input those two now. And I've had an overflow here. The plus three spice required has been auto-filled without me actually needing to use any. You may not have even had these to begin with, but it's completed it anyway. And this makes the rank four perk seem incredibly useful. What I will say though is, I've been playing around with this not on rank 4, and sudden developments seem to happen fairly frequently anyway, so at rank 4 they must be really common, but I'm not going to go as far as saying rank 4 is an essential perk. Overall I'll say that if you craft a lot, and most of us will at some point, then this is an average perk at ranks 1 and 2, with 3 and 4 being above average. Next we have the surveying perk. And what this does at each level is add a zoom to your hand scanner whilst also increasing the distance of your scanner. This therefore is by no means an essential skill, you can scan perfectly fine without it. But if you plan to do any serious cataloguing, especially for some of the missions which require you to catalogue planets, you're definitely going to want to invest in this skill if you don't want to go insane trying to find random animals or plants. As such, I will rank level 1 as above average, with ranks 2 to 4 average unless you're a scanning completist, in which case get them as well. Our final tree is the tech tree, and the base row of this tree may contain the best selection of perks yet. The first of these is ballistic weapon systems. In short, your ships have a few different weapon classes, ballistic, laser, missile, particle and electromagnetic. And my ship here has the first three of those types, which are the most common. Ballistic Weapon Systems is a useful skill as it's the only ship combat skill available in the game from the beginning. However, if you want to make use for it straight away, you'll need to either get a new ship or change the Frontier's configuration, as the Frontier's primary weapon type is set as lasers. But overall, I'd say this is a middle of the road skill, useful, but not a game changer. And later on, you may find it more beneficial to invest in one particular weapon type for your ships, such as lasers. Next up, we have Boost Pack Training and rank 1 of this perk allows you to use boost packs, so this is a perk on the levels of stealth in my opinion. Why would you want to not have access to one of the most fun features in Starfield? It came as one of the three perks I had in the soldier background to start with, but honestly if I didn't have it, this would be one of the earliest perks I picked up. It's absolutely essential. And what ranks 2 to 4 do is expend less fuel, then regenerate it quicker, and then finally double both those previous bonuses. What happens at this level is, on weaker gravity planets and moons, you can essentially fly. This is one of the few perks on the first level of skills where going all the way up to rank 4 is a bona fide top tier. Next up we have piloting, and I'm going to say it right off the bat, this is another top tier rank all the way through. At rank 1 you gain access to the ship thrusters, and in short this massively improves your manoeuvrability, making you much more effective in combat. I wish I'd picked this skill up earlier than I did and then maybe I wouldn't have been blown up a few times early on. And the difference in how your ship handles is night and day as you'll be able to avoid being hit and also keep your enemies in your sights without feeling like you're trying to turn an oil tanker. As is shown in the initial flight tutorial, when you get access to the frontier, ship speed is controlled by the left stick if you use a controller like me and manoeuvring is done by the right stick. I'm going to power down speed to zero now, and with the rank 1 perk if you hold down RB and then use your left analogue stick, you can use the thrusters which allows for more subtle movements left right, up and down. Let's just point ourselves at this planet here and see how long it takes to turn without the thrusters. so about 10 seconds to do a full 360 in this ship. And now let's combine turning with the thrusters. And we managed that in less than 5 seconds, so less than half the time it took to turn without them. And you can use your thrusters when moving as well for quicker turns. I'd advise getting used to these controls before any serious combat, but once you get used to it, you can start to combine it with using your speed boost, which will make you even more effective in combat. At rank 2 of this skill, your ship's manoeuvrability and turn rate increases even further. And finally at ranks 3 and 4 in this skill, it allows you to fly class B and class C ships. So this skill has entire classes locked behind its final two perks. So overall, a skill that every player should invest in and look to max out. Our penultimate skill is lockpicking, 
and this is the third skill in a row where I'm going to say at least ranks 1 to 3 are essential for all players. Hey, I did say tech had probably the best basic level perks of the lot. Rank 1 allows you to attempt advanced locks and allows 2 auto attempts to be banked. Rank 2 is expert locks with 3 banked auto attempts, with the added benefit of rings now turning blue if the pick can be slotted. And rank 3 is master locks and 4 auto attempts can be banked. And at finally at rank 4 it allows you to use a digipick to eliminate all keys that aren't required to solve the puzzle, with 5 auto attempts now being able to be banked. Ranks 1 to 3 I think are essential as without them you can't even attempt the lock, and who wants to find a chest and when to realise you can't open it? It doesn't extend to chests either, you'll encounter locked doors as well which you need to be able to pick to access. Rank 4 is the only one here that I wouldn't deem essential, as you can pick locks without it perfectly fine providing you know what you're doing. Rank 4 just eliminates most risk associated with losing digipicks on harder locks. And finally our last skill is targeting and control systems. Ok go on then, rank 1 of this skill tree is essential as well, there I said it. What this does is it unlocks a ship's targeting functionality, which basically translates as, you can select certain parts of a ship to hit. Well, why is this important? Well if you're facing a 3 on 1, you might not have time to fully destroy all 3 ships, so you can target their weapons and disable them, allowing you to focus on remaining ships whilst one is out of action. Or, you can target a ship's engines and disable them, meaning instead of blowing the ship up, you can actually board it, which means all the loot on board is available to you, providing you can take the crew down. And once dealt with, you can then take the ship as your own. And that's right, without targeting control systems, you can't be a space pirate, and everyone should have the option of being a space pirate. Ranks 2 to 4 make targeting more effective to increase speed, increase crit chance and additional systems damage and so on. So these probably fall into somewhere between mid tier and above average, but it's rank 1 that is essential. And that concludes our review on the basic skill tiers within each group. I thought I'd just quickly show how I had spent some of my perks on one of my saves, which hopefully highlights some of what I have just spoken about. So I have 1 point into fitness, 1 point into stealth, and one point into wellness in the physical tree. In social I have one in persuasion and one in theft. In combat I have three in ballistics and one in shotgun certification. In science I have just one in medicine, although on my let's play save I also have research methods at this point. And then lastly in tech I have 1 in boost pack training, 1 in piloting, 2 in lock picking and 1 in targeting control systems. I think I was level 12 or 13 at this stage so probably about 10 hours in I think. So moving back to gameplay tips, I've mentioned this during the skill review but I'm a scavenger and I highly recommend all players getting into the habit of looting right from the start. Bodies are an obvious one after fights, but it's going to be a primary way of getting credits, weapons, ammo, gear and healing items. Taking weapons and gear early on to sell is a great way of amassing credits from the start, and if you want to get into any serious shipbuilding later on, you'll need a lot of credits for parts. Many locations in Starfield will be jam packed with stuff that you can pick up, and it's not immediately obvious what they might be. To save yourself time and make the process of scavenging a little bit easier, you can use your hand scanner to highlight any items you're able to pick up. I didn't immediately realise this and at first I was just taking my time walking around checking tables and in every corner, but doing it this way is definitely a lot easier and quicker. Your hand scanner is also useful if you find yourself unsure of how to get to your next mission objective. If you have a destination the scanner will show you a route you can follow and this is especially useful on large ships or in buildings with multiple floors where it's not immediately clear where you need to go. If you've played Skyrim you'll be used to skill books offering permanent increases and if you're familiar with Fallout they were pamphlets. Well in Starfield it's the latter and you'll find these scattered what around all over. With? If you follow the early main campaign the first you might encounter is in the lodge and this permanently reduces fall damage by 5% but they can increase a wide range of aspects such as carry capacity, weapon range, damage output and how stealthy you are, so keep your eyes peeled as you venture across the settled systems and beyond. 
Something I wish I had picked up on earlier is weapon quality versus rarity. The latter is more obvious. Common weapons are white, rare are blue, epic are purple and finally legendary are yellow and I lazily just assumed rarer meant better. We have three coachmans here and with each rarity we have a new effect slot, so the common has no effects, the rare has one and the epic has two. But notice on the right how the stats of the shotguns don't actually change. Everything by the value and the effects is identical. Well weapons also have a quality rating. Take this base Kraken for example, it's a common weapon that does 4 physical damage. Here is a calibrated Kraken, it's also a common weapon, but notice how this one does 6 physical damage. There are 4 levels above base that determine the quality of a weapon. Calibrated is level 2, and then there's refined, advanced and superior. Now weapon quality does seem to be tied to your overall level, so you won't be finding superior weapons at level 1, whereas it's possible to find legendary weapons the minute you set foot in space, but balancing quality and rarity is something worth keeping an eye on if you are after the best weapons. This is another tip I wish I'd known way earlier than I discovered it. So once I had a few hundred thousand credits, I stopped looting basic weapons from dead enemies and only took more exotic ones or ones worth selling. But if you do this as I did, you're going to be missing out on a lot of ammunition. Take this dead pirate for example, I take his credits and his ammo, but leave the Grendel. I'll just quickly show here how much ammo we are carrying. So 7.77 mil caseless we are carrying 173. So if I pick up these 34 here, we have 207 right? Well enemies weapons will contain a full magazine, minus any shots they've fired, and any ammo inside a gun you pick up is automatically transferred to your inventory. So after grabbing this Grendel we now have 257 rounds, accounting for the full magazine inside. I probably miss out on so much free ammo this way, I normally just drop the weapons I don't want after, as long as you don't mind a little bit of inventory management it's a great way of getting more ammo. Another gameplay feature that was staring at me right in the face, yet it took me until a good few hours until I actually used it once, and even after then I kept forgetting to do it, is resting bonuses. I mean I've played Skyrim for over a decade, so I should have known this, but find a bed and sleep in it, even if it's only for one hour. You'll get a 10% experience gain for 25 minutes, and the great thing about this is it can stack with certain foods like alien tea that give you an XP boost as well. Once you start travelling with constellation companions, you'll notice they react to your actions and conversation responses, and these could be positive or negative. They may like or dislike something you say or do, or sometimes they may love or hate it. We've got a few more well, needs we should talk about. continuing to improve their opinion of you enough and you'll eventually notice options to flirt with them. Well, yeah, and you'll probably know where this is are. going. After but after a while, heard, they'll start to confide in you and you can help them you with their problems have... and insecurities. And after that, they'll eventually have a special mission to accomplish with them. Sarah's, as shown here, is in memoriam. Eventually, after completing this mission, you can remain as friends or take things one step further into a committed relationship. If you select the latter, from this point onwards if you sleep in a bed, they'll stay with you and your well rested bonus is upgraded to a newfound sense of emotional security, and poor Sarah looks like she's pulled something. Anyway, it's a bit long winded to get here, but you'll now have a 15% experience boost instead of 10% for 25 minutes, and it's definitely more immersive than Skyrim's wear an amulet of Mara. Hey, do you fancy getting married? It's a worthwhile exercise kitting out your followers with good weapons no as well, especially if you find yourself needing a bit of extra backup during combat. But the best thing about giving your followers weapons though, is you only need to leave them with one bullet for the weapon in question. As long as they have one in their inventory, they'll continue to fire the weapon as if they have unlimited ammo, a bit like how archery works on followers in Skyrim. Once they have the weapon you want them to use and they've got one bullet, you can force them to equip it as shown here. This is especially useful on high DPS weapons like grenade launchers or this giant minigun that Sarah is wielding here. In most fights you can just stand behind them and watch them mow your enemies down. If you really want to turn the carnage up a notch though, give them one frag grenade and also force equip it. You throw these with alarming regularity, often commenting each time. Just be careful if you do this as your followers don't seem to care if you are in the line of fire or not and you don't want to find yourself missing a limb.
yeah, it's definitely safer to hang back here. Finally, don't forget to give them any useful spacesuits or clothing as well. They will benefit from armour with better starts in the same way you will. The only thing to consider is what type of effects you are equipping them with. So gear that boosts health, resistance, damage output, or gives them neat effects like chameleon or reflect damage are all going to be useful. But take this epic survival pack. Its first effect is extra oxygen capacity. And although this might be useful to you, it's going to be pretty useless to your companion. All ships have varying sizes of cargo hold for you to store stuff inside and you're absolutely going to want to make use of this as it's very easy to find yourself out of carry weight in Starfield. What is useful about your ship's carry weight is, if you ever find yourself crafting or building at an outpost, you can do this direct from your cargo hold, so I make a habit of storing all my resources in here and not carrying it with me. Okay, what is no also problem. useful about your cargo hold though is, say you want to change your ship to another ship like so, your current ship's cargo hold will transfer directly to your new ship, and it does this even if it takes it to over your new ship's capacity. You won't be able to fit any more stuff in until you fix it, but you don't need to worry about anything getting left behind. Just be careful not to use the captain's locker on the frontier like I did. This doesn't transfer and will stay with the frontier. The Lodge, home to Constellation, is likely going to be most players' first home, and it has a handy workshop downstairs in the basement for all your research, crafting and modifying needs. But what is also useful is this little storage box here. Notice how this box doesn't have a maximum mass. This box acts like an infinite box of holding, and anything you store in here is pulled directly to whichever station you are stood at. The crafting stations also pull from your ship's cargo, but it's still a really useful tool mainly because there's no limit to what you can put in here, so you can leave your ship's cargo for your outpost building materials only, for example, and then in this box you can put stuff to do your weapon modifications and your crafting and so on. It won't be long in Starfield before you come across contraband goods, and these are often items of immense value, but the catch is, if you get caught with these, you're going to get arrested and they'll be confiscated. Thankfully, there are a few easy ways you can move these items on before they land you in hot water. The first is a nice handy little system where they aren't going to scan your ship and find anything you'd rather they didn't. And what you want to do is head to the star map. And then in between the Alpha Centauri and Sol systems, two of the earlier systems you explore, you'll find the small wolf system just here. This is a very small system with only two planets. Orbiting the innermost planet is something called the Den. Travel here, and there are no scans here, so just dock with the station like so. Den acknowledging incoming hail. Docking bay one is free. Once on board, head to the Trade Authority and speak to Marcel. Always a pleasure to meet someone new. So, you're just as stuck Welcome to the Trade Authority. I'm Marcel, and if there's anything, anything I can do for you, please do let me know. You can move on your contraband here before anyone in the settled systems even knows you had it, and earn yourself a nice little pay packet in the process. Let's say you've stolen something that wasn't yours though. If you've ever played any of the Grand Theft Auto games back in the day, do you remember how if you were being followed by the cops in a stolen car, you could just drive into a garage and get a respray and then come out and head off like nothing had happened? Well, modification also works in Starfield. All I'm going to do to this stolen Grendel is add a new grip to it. And now look, the stolen tag is gone. A super easy way of hiding stolen goods. One of the main selling points of Starfield was, and quote, over a thousand planets to explore. Well if you include the moons as well, there's nearly 1700 planetoid objects to explore. And one of the tasks you can do is to catalogue them, which involves scanning the resources, flora and fauna. This is called surveying, and you can't just scan one of each thing and be done with it. You need to scan multiple in order to fully understand behaviour, habitat, temperament and so on. And for a completist like me, 
I actually find this a cathartic experience, a break from the heat of combat or completing missions and so on. Well if this is something you're interested in, there's actual missions where you can be paid to do this. The first is via Phil Hill, who you'll find sat in the bar area of Sidonia. And what Phil is interested in is planets that can support life. And these are the ones he is willing to pay you for the survey data. And this mission is titled Top of the List. But as I say, Phil is only interested in planets that List can send colonists to. Vlad on the eye is also interested in survey data, but he'll take any planet. I don't believe he gives as much credits as Phil will for habitable planets, but you'll be able to sell any data to him, just tell him I've got some survey data for you. So how does ship travel work in Starfield? Well in short, you're basically fast travelling from one place to the next. There's no interplanetary ship flight where you can fly from Mercury to Venus for example. You'll have a short cutscene as you take your seat in your cockpit, and then you can opt to fly into orbit, at which point you get another short cutscene as your ship takes off. Once in space, if you have a destination set, you'll have a little blue marker as shown here. And you can then grab jump to that planet, moon or system from here. And then you get another short cutscene. Once in your new system, if you want to land on the planet, select it and choose land, and then you get another loading screen, and then you may even get another cutscene as your ship lands. So all in all, that was about 90 seconds to get to Aquila City right. Now I don't gripe on this too much, it's a little more immersive I guess, but after sinking many hours into the game, you've seen this hundreds of times. Well. You can actually fast travel direct from your menu if you've got a destination set. Just hit the set course button shown down here and then you can skip needing to go into space or do any grav jumping, saving yourself over half the time. Make use of your quick slots as you have 12 spaces in total for your most used items. I have my healing items in here, my explosives, my cutter plus my favourite weapons and it's far quicker than cycling through menu after menu to find something. If you want to set something in your favourites, just click the favourite button as shown down here, and you can then pick which slot you want to use, and now that item is available to switch to without needing to go into your inventory. This actually took me ages to realise you could do this, but sometimes if you're running around in your spacesuit like some damn tourist, the locals may comment on this as shown here. Well if you click onto your helmets and your spacesuits as shown here, there's a button at the bottom called hide in breathable areas. Select this and then you'll take this off automatically if the atmosphere is breathable. You can also do this in your spacesuit section as well. And what happens now is you'll wear whatever is selected within your apparel section. The only watch out with this is I've found is sometimes you won't auto wear your suit and helmet again if the conditions turn less than favourable. So for example if a dust storm starts on Aquila City, you'll still be running around breathing all that in if you don't manually put it back on again. Another thing I found randomly, but you can actually shoot asteroids and mine stuff from them. It's not the most timely way of gathering, but it's still pretty cool that you can get resources from them. One of the first things that happens to you in Starfield is you get given a ship. And the Frontier is okay I guess, but there's hundreds of ships out there, many of them with better stats than this, so you're going to want to build up a fleet of more powerful and larger ships before long. One that is well documented by now is via the quest Secret Outpost, which is a random drop from dead spaces whereby you have to fight your way through a secret base to try and get your hands on the prize at the end. Said prize is the Mantis suit and the Razor Leaf ship which is an adequate upgrade early on. And this is only one of many quests that involve ships though. 
There's another Class A ship on Jaffa 4 at the Vulture's Roost. And this is a fun quest where you have to fight off hordes of ecliptic mercenaries. There's also lots of contraband here, so bring a ton of digipics, and even a bar which plays heavy metal music. And at the end, you can commandeer the dagger ship. But if you really want to get yourself one of the top Class A ships in the game, complete the Free Star Rangers questline early on, which starts in Akili City. The end prize is pretty awesome, but this is just the tip of the iceberg though. Eventually well, you'll want Class B and C ships, so see what you can locate across the galaxy. Just so you know what you're getting into. Finally, and I don't want to give away too much here, but after completing the Old Neighbourhood quest for Constellation, you'll get access to three quests. These are The Empty Nest, Into the Unknown, and Back to Vectera. You can do these in any order, it doesn't matter, but what I recommend is at least complete Into the Unknown before you go off and do other things and explore what Starfield has to offer. If you don't, you'll be missing out on a key aspect of gameplay, and that's all I'll say about it in case you haven't done it yet. And that's it for my new player tips on Starfield. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed my video. I'm Mike the Gaming Dad, and I'll see you next time.